All right, welcome back, critical thinkers. Today we're going to be talking about problems with language. Last time what we talked about was how language was a superpower, right? How it needed to be used with great responsibility um, because it's such an amazing ability that we have as human beings. And so today we're going to sort of talk about the, the ways that language can be a stumbling block, can get in the way of figuring out what truth is, right? So make sure you have the lecture notes open called Problems with Language, right? And of course, we're not going to cover the entire universe of all the ways that language can become problematic. We're really just going to focus on some of the big ways, some of the most common ways for language to be used um, inappropriately in a quest for truth, which of course is the goal of a critical thinker, to figure out what's true. Right? And so use this lecture today as um, a sort of a guide for what not to do yourself, but also to recognize when language might be um, used manipulatively against you to interfere with your ability to figure out what's true. Right? So the first slide we have here in our lecture is just a comic from Dilbert, um, which talks about um, you know, weasel words, that kind of idea, which is one of the ways that language can be used manipulatively, which we'll talk about today. So slide two sort of is just an overview of the kind of things we're going to cover. We're going to cover vagueness, ambiguity, and then a concept of doublespeak. And then lastly, we're going to talk about weasel words. All right, so what is vagueness? Um, vagueness is when you essentially don't say anything specific with your language, right? You're vague. You're, you use really abstract ideas when you could be using concrete words. You don't specify exactly what you're trying to say. And this is the most common in like advertising, right? But it can also be used in like everyday life. For example, uh, let's say in your romantic relationship, uh, if you have ever been in one, someone, someone asks you where you're gonna go and you say out. When are you gonna come back? soon, right? You haven't been specific because ostensibly you're trying to be vague. You're trying not to give people information. And that's the problem with vagueness is you haven't actually given anybody information when you're vague, right? Um, and so, and when this I think is used the most often is in advertising. Um, you know, Coke, it's the real thing. Well, the real what exactly? Um, get clothes whiter than white. What is whiter than white? White is a white is you know the absence of a of color, and how can you get whiter than that? It's not telling you anything specific. It just sounds good, and that's the problem with vagueness. It maybe kind of sort of sounds like somebody's giving you information, but in reality they've they've done nothing at all, right? And it can be really effective in advertising, like Nike. Just do it. Well, just do what exactly? Well, they want you to fill in the blank with your own ideas, right? So it's an effective slogan. It can be a, very catchy to use vague phrases in advertising, but also in politics, right? To use vague phrases that don't actually say anything because then people sort of fill in the blanks with um, whatever they want that phrase to mean. But if you're a critical thinker, you don't want vagueness. You want specifics, you want concrete, you want clarity, and vagueness doesn't allow you to do that. Moving on to slide four is a, a concept in language we call ambiguity. Now in everyday life, this word ambiguous, ambiguity, simply means you're not sure. Things are unclear. And so you might be asking yourself, well, how is that different than vagueness? Well, vagueness is making a phrase that says nothing at all, right? You're, you're, you're just vague. I'll be back soon. Ambiguity is really this idea that you could, you're you more than one thing at the same time, right? Like if I have ambiguous feelings about someone, that doesn't mean I don't have any feelings about them. That means I have maybe positive feelings about them as well as negative. And that's what ambiguous means. It's not unclear because you don't have an idea. It's unclear because you have multiple ideas. And when language is amb ambiguous, has ambiguity, it means you've said a phrase or used a word that has two meanings, kind of purposely or maybe accidentally, but either way, you've said something that can be interpreted in more than one way. And when we actually talked about the fallacies, we actually talked about the concept of equivocation and how equivocation is, an ex is actually an example of ambiguity. You use a word in more than one way, so you're not exactly sure what the person means. 
And whole phrases um, can be ambiguous. Um, and this can be used in advertising, it can be used in politics, it can be used in everyday life. Um, but where it's the most often seen is in humor, right? Somebody will say something um, that can be interpreted in more than one way and that becomes ambiguous and so then very funny. So what I want you to watch in slide five, um, uh, or what I want you to go over in slide five, is some examples of real world ambiguity. So here we have it in humor. Bob Hope tells this joke, um, brave men run in my family. Now why is this funny? Well, because this can be interpreted in two ways. You could interpret brave men run in my family as they are f they, like it's a trait that, you know, her through heredity and genetics, bravery is this trait that men in his family have. Or it can be interpreted in a different way, meaning bravery in his family means literally running away on two legs, like fleeing, right? And that's why it's funny, because there's an this ambiguous nature. But it happens all the time um, in real world situations that have nothing to do with humor, right? Um, uh, so like Leahy wants FBI to help corrupt the Iraqi police force. How is this ambiguous? Well, it couldn't, and this is actually a real headline that was from CNN, right? And this is just an ambiguous thing to say. Does that mean the FBI wants to make the Iraqi police force corrupt? Or does it mean that Leahy wants the FBI to help a police force that is already corrupt become not corrupt? That one sentence can be interpreted in more than one way. It's ambiguous, so problematic. If you want language to communicate clear and effective ideas, right? Or prostitutes appeal to the Pope. Well, this can be interpreted in more than one way. It could be interpreted as um, the, uh, the Pope is finding prostitutes very appealing, like in a good way. Or it could mean, and more likely means, that the prostitutes have come to the Pope and asked for assistance. They are appealing to him um, in some capacity. But this was a real newspaper headline, right? And it was an ambiguous one. And so, and, and that's problematic because again, you want language to be clear. Um, and then a couple of a uh, couple of other ones. Um, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed meeting your husband. Actually, comes from a book on uh, ambiguity, well, about problematic use of language, right? Because this can be interpreted in multiple ways. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed meeting your husband. Could mean that you hate him, so you can't tell that you actually enjoyed him. It could mean you enjoyed meeting him so much that you're at a loss for words, or it could mean you can't tell. Uh, this wife, how much you enjoyed meeting your husband because maybe you were in the like the back room with him, right? So you have these statements that can be interpreted in more than one way, so they become ambiguous. They don't communicate truth. And the last one, it comes from Sleepless in Seattle, which is a movie from 1993. Um, Thanks for dinner. I've never seen potatoes cooked that way before. Um, does that mean you really liked them? Does that mean you hated them? Does that mean it was just super strange? You don't know, right? It's ambiguous. And, it's, and a lot of times ambiguity is used intentionally um, to leave a person with an unclear impression, right? Sometimes it's just used accidentally, but that's still a problem for critical thinking because we need words to be used with clarity. So moving on to slide six, just to sort of drive home what ambiguity is, um, I, have, uh, I want you guys to watch a classic comedy sketch that uses ambiguity in um, the search for humor. It's just an excellent example of ambiguous language and how it can prevent communication, completely cause communication to break down, um, but this is a, a humorous context. I'm gonna, I want you to watch who's on first. So stop this video and go watch this, uh, and this is a fully accessible, um, uh, it's a fully accessible, meaning it's got it's closed captioning, um, this video of, of who's on first, Abbott and Costello, and then come back. All right, we back. Fantastic. All right, so moving on to, and that, so that is just a fantastic example of ambiguity, right? You're interpreting the name who in more than one way. Is it that person's name? Well, that's certainly not how it's being understood. Uh, what, all these different sort of, and it's, it's hilarious, right? But imagine in real life situations where ambiguity interferes with the ability to communicate. Um, like for example, if you're driving in a car and someone says, uh, you know, do, should I turn left here? And the person says, right. Now, do they mean, no, 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 you need to turn right, or do they mean that is correct? It's ambiguity, and so it gets in the way of effective communication. All right, so then we move on to slide seven with a concept called doublespeak. 
Now, doublespeak is a phrase that has a very specific academic meaning. What doublespeak is, is intentional. Do you hear that important word? Intentional. That means the person is doing it on purpose. Doublespeak is an intentional use of manipulative language so that you leave a, a person, a listener, if you as a speaker or you as an arguer leave your audience, leave your listener with the opposite impression, right? Uh, where you want to make it seem like you're telling the truth, and but in reality, you're actually lying. But it's not just straight up lying, right? It's the manipulative use of language to leave someone with a false impression. It's called doublespeak. Right, where you where you make it seem like you're telling the truth, but in reality you're using language in a manipulative fashion in order to leave someone with a false impression. So it ends up being kind of like a lie, where you can make the bad look good, or you can make the neutral seem better, or you can sort of ignore painful truths. Right, um, and these and, and there. So we're going to cover two types of double speak. Now again. Double speak is not outright lying, right? You're not going, um, the sky is green, right? What do you mean the sky is green? The sky's not green. It's not, or if you said you're gonna be, if you, if you, if you wanna, uh, or when you got home at, at 10, and when your, your family asked you, hey, when did you get home? I got home at seven, right? That's not double speak. That's just outright lying, right? What I want, what I want to talk about is the manipulative use of language, the intentional use of language, where you have the veneer of truth, the veneer of truth, where someone couldn't necessarily pin you down and say, hey, you just outright lied to me, but you leave someone with a false impression on purpose. That is doublespeak. And we're gonna cover two different types of doublespeak, right? So here's some examples of doublespeak, and let's see if you can sort of detect why these are manipulative, manipulative and deceptive. Um, let's say I ask you this question, are you in favor of welfare? Hmm, but maybe I know that the word welfare has negative connotations uh, among certain communities. And so instead of asking, how do you feel about welfare? I say, well, how do you feel about assistance to the poor? See, I've carefully chosen my words, right? Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe I want, maybe I want people to have a bad impression of, of, of welfare. So I use that word, welfare, or uh, as opposed to assistance to the poor. Right? This can be argued that it's double speak if you're intentionally using different words to describe the exact same phenomenon because you know it's going to leave the person listening with a different impression. That's double speak because it's manipulative. And you're not trying to reveal truth. You're not trying to get people's actual opinions. You're trying to lead them to have a particular point of view by an emotional manipulative use of language. Or how about this? Do you think the U.S. should spend more on the military versus uh, would you uh, would you rather uh, support the national defense? The word military versus national defense have very different emotional connotations, right? And so you might, as a manipulative person, use different emotional words to sort of get the point of view you're looking for, right? Because maybe I know among a particular uh, group of people, the word military has a negative connotation, but I want to sort of make it seem as though everyone is supporting um, the uh, sort of military spending. And so instead of using the word military, I use the phrase national defense instead, right? Where I know that the, using that phrase is going to increase the amount of support um, from the people I'm asking this question of. And it's manipulative, right? And when people are engaged in doublespeak, they're choosing words carefully in order to get the reaction they want from people. They're not trying to truly find what people believe. They're not trying to make things clear for their audience. They're trying to manipulate language in order to get the version of truth they want in people's heads. And it's, it's manipulative and it's called doublespeak. So the two types of language that can often be used as doublespeak, um, so now we're on slide nine are euphemisms and jargon, and it's the two we're going to cover. Now, euphemisms and jargon are not always doublespeak. Once we learn what we are, they are, we know that they can be perfectly innocent usages of language, right? Euphemisms and jargon are just two different types of language use, right? But when they're used manipulatively, intentionally, then they become doublespeak, and they're some really effective tools of doublespeak. So what is a euphemism? Well, essentially, a euphemism is making um, the bad seem good or the neutral seem better 
or make the really bad seem not as bad. It's, it's a softening of language. That is what a euphemism is. It's describing something in a way that isn't that in a way that has a more has a different emotional reaction uh, for people. Now, here's an example, the more, probably one of the most common euphemisms um, that is not doublespeak. It's saying somebody passed away, or someone is not with us anymore, or they've passed on. How we talk about death is often um, spoken of euphemistically, um, in, and that's not doublespeak, right? It's not manipulative to say, um, oh, I'm so sorry that your uncle passed away, oh, oh I'm so sorry that your, your, your dog's no longer with us. Right, because that feels better to people, right? It's a it's a tactful use of euphemism, right? And it's not manipulative, you're just being considerate with someone's emotions. And a lot of time euphemisms are used just tactfully. And in that regard, they're not they're not doublespeak. For example, if a student comes to me and, and wants to know how they're doing in class and they're not and they're and they're failing, right? I could say, Well, you're failing. But that might that's that's kind of harsh, right? So I might say, well, you're, you're really not doing that great. Um, I mean, you're, you're really struggling in class, and I'm, and I'm not sure how, if, whether or not you're going to pass. It sort of means the same thing, denotively, right? Remember denotation? It means the same thing with, in, with denotation, but the connotations are very different. I think that's the essence of um, euphemisms. It's using different words that have different connotations um, in order to make someone have a different emotional reaction. That's what a, a euphemism is. And it's not always doublespeak. For example, to say passed away is not doublespeak. It's definitely, it's definitely a euphemism, but it's not doublespeak, right? So let's talk about when euphemisms are doublespeak, right? So let's say, um, uh, if I say, well, I don't, I don't, let's say I, I notice someone is lying, right? But I don't want to make this person feel bad about the fact that they're lying. I'm like, um, you seem to have some terminological inexactitudes, right, in your in your language. Or, um, um, you seem to only have a passing interest in the truth here, instead of just straight up saying that they're lying, right? Um, right. But if, or maybe I'm a politician, and instead of saying, "Hey, I lied," I was like, "Well, I just had a terminological inexactitude." Mm. And that's manipulative. That becomes doublespeak. If I'm doing it to manipulate my audience into thinking I'm not a liar by saying, well, I, you know, did I lie? I had some terminological inexactitudes or some categorical inaccuracies, right? You're like, what? That you were, you know, that's, that is doublespeak because you're being manipulative. Or how about what companies do when they describe um, what they do to their, when they fire people, right? When you're fired, in, no, 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 no. Your position was downsized, right? Oh no, you've had a voluntary. Well, this is a voluntary severance for you. Um, uh, we're going to vocationally relocate these positions. We had a strategic downsizing of thirty percent of our workforce, and it's double speak if they're trying to get their investors and they're trying to get the public and they're trying to get um, their workers to feel differently about what has happened in order to have not have people judge them negatively, right? It's manipulative, right? It's manipulative when they're trying to get people to feel differently about um, the fact that they've just fired a bunch of people, right? Like if they, let's say they uh, do an interview with Time Magazine and they say, um, you know, we're, we're downsizing 30% of our, downsizing 30% of our workforce as opposed to saying we're going to fire 30% of our, our staff. Right? Because they want to leave the readers of Time Magazine with a different impression. And it's manipulative and it's doublespeak. Or let's say um, we want to talk about like senior citizens and we talk about them be, we don't want to say they're old. We want to make them feel all warm and fuzzy about us because maybe again we're politicians and we want to make these senior citizens like us, right? So we call them senior citizens. We never refer to them as older folks or elderly folks. Um, and, if, and if the goal is to not be tactful, if the goal is to be manipulative, then it's doublespeak. And so let's, uh, let me try to come up with the clearest cut example as I, of I can of true doublespeak euphemistic language, right? Because maybe you argue that the term senior citizen, citizen, senior citizen is just tactful. And maybe you, and maybe you would argue that, you know, a business talking about, you know, downsizing their workforce is, well, they're just being tactful. 
I would argue that's double speak, but hey. So let's actually, uh, I want to try to come up with an example that's clearly double speak, a manipulative use of language to leave a false impression. So this, is, uh, so this is a real example that came from a fashion magazine. There was this designer named uh, David Blanche, and he designed it for this com company called Umbro. And here is how he described a new product to this fashion magazine. The shirts boast intelligent ventilation points. Yeah, he was referring to the armholes. Intelligent ventilation points. Armholes, yeah, hmm, yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> this is not this is not being tactful, right? This is not trying to just uh, you know make his product um, describe his product in an accurate way. He is actually trying to manipulate you into thinking his shirt is awesome when it's just a shirt. How about this? Shirts incorporates tailored shoulder darts specifically designed to accommodate the biodynamics of the shoulder. Um, he was talking about a shoulder seam. And I've actually never worn a shirt that didn't have a shoulder seam. So again, this becomes um, clearly double speak, trying to get people to think his shirt is fantastic when it's just an ordinary shirt. It's manipulative. It's double speak because he's doing it on purpose to leave a false impression. All right, so now I want you to watch. Uh, uh, a clip from a uh, George Carlin uh, stand-up uh, stand routine. Um, now the whole routine, uh, just so you know, if you happen to go out and watch this movie, um, George Carlin uses some pretty harsh, uh, you know, racial epithets, some racial slurs as a part of this com uh, comedy, uh, uh, the, the, the whole comedy sketch. And he's, I think, just to be aware of if you decide to, after watching this clip, to go watch um, the whole video, um, recognize that I'm not endorsing the use of any racial slurs. Um, I think he is trying to get at um, something deeper um, about sort of the problematic use of language um, and how language can be used as a weapon. Um, and he actually uses these racial slurs um, to sort of make a point. And I'm not endorsing that or, or, or condemning that. I'm not, um, I just wanted you to be aware that there are no racial slurs in, the, in these clips um, that I'm gonna show you. But if you should happen to watch the full video um, because you're inspired by these clips, just be aware that he will end up using some pretty harsh language. Um, um, but this clip is just about euphemisms um, and how George Carlin uh, really doesn't like euphemistic language because rightly he thinks it obscures the truth. And he uses um, the example, um, well, I'll let you watch it. Watch it and then, um, then uh, come back and we'll talk about, um, and, and, and I'll discuss a little bit about um, his point of view. Um, so go ahead and watch um, that clip. All right, you back? Fantastic. All right, so here we have um, here we have uh, um, uh, essentially a uh, a discussion of the t of the of the of the gradual change in how the exact same uh, condition uh, sort of being used different words sort of being used um, uh, to describe it and. Um, and I think this really really gets at an important consideration of when is euphemism you are euphemisms double speak, because he talks about how it was the federal government that stopped using um, uh, shell, to, being shell shocked, which was the phrase in World War One, then became battle fatigue, then it became operational exhaustion, right? And these were the, actually terms that that the federal government started using to refer to this battle condition, and arguably. If the federal government was changing the words they used to describe this condition in a manipulative way to get the public and um, and, polit and and politicians to feel differently about this condition, then that's double speak. Now, when he gets to the last one, though, post traumatic post traumatic stress disorder, um, that actually was coined by psychologists, and I get his point, and I agree with his point that this this long phrase uh, post traumatic stress disorder may um, have originally sounded really double speaky like uh, because it sort of takes all of the pain out of the of the disorder right where someone experiencing this and you say you're shell shocked versus post traumatic stress disorder maybe you argue um, they don't get because of the use of language in this way um, people aren't getting access to resources but arguably psychologists are not using this 
with with double speak, right? Psychologists are describe are trying to describe something in an academic way that it's it's after a trauma you're having a stress response, right? But again, if politicians are using this phrase to sort of soften the people's experience to sort of not give people funding for treatment, then that's doublespeak. And if a psychologist is using this phrase to simply describe the psychological reality of the disorder, then it's not doublespeak. Either way, it's a euphemism. It feels very different. You know, shell shock versus post-traumatic stress disorder. Either way, um, I think it can become problematic if you don't educate yourself on what these words mean. And of course, most psychologists are fully educated on what it means to have post-traumatic stress disorder. And arguably, this talk of George Carlin's happened, um, I think, almost 20 years ago now. And I think that there's a lot more understanding in society about post-traumatic stress disorder. But his point is clear. Um, either way, you have, uh, you, if you change the words you use to describe something in a manipulative way, then that can have real consequences for how you treat, how you think about a topic. Um, and so sort of take the, take the truth from this talk, um, even if um, the, uh, his example of post-traumatic stress disorder um, isn't the best one, at least nowadays. Another type of, so those are euphemisms, a softening of language that can sometimes be used manipulatively. Euphemisms like being, having passed away or talking senior citizens or, um, you know, battle fatigue, right? If it's used manipulatively, then that is doublespeak. Another common uh, f feature of language that can be used manipulatively is jargon. Now, what is jargon? Jargon is not a softening of language the way euphemisms are. It's not an improving of language the way euphemisms are. Um, rather, it's using technical terms um, that are specific to a profession or specific to a trade or hobby, right? Um, so, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, you might argue, is jargon. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it could be used euphemistically, where you're just softening the feel of that disorder, or it could be used as a psychologist as jargon, right? A, sp a word that's used specifically in that trade. And jargon is not necessarily doublespeak either. Think about like doctors. Doctors talk in jargon a lot, right? Like oncology, where you talk about, or uh, if you're a fertility doctor, you might talk about blastocytes. Or if I'm a psychologist, I may talk about, you know, dissociative personality disorder. And these are gonna be words that are specialized to that trade. Or let's say um, you're a knitter and you talk about uh, knitting and purling, or let's say you're a skateboarder and like you have some sort of like, um, I think, what was it, double ollie? I don't know, right? Or if you're a figure skater and you talk about like a triple toe loop, or if you're a mechanic and you're talking about, you know, um, uh, transmissions and, uh, fuel pans and uh, uh, I don't know anything about cars so I'm I'm at a loss right so there are these words that are really only familiar to people who practice a particular profession or a particular hobby um, and it's not doublespeak when you're using these jargon words with people who definitely understand them right if you're a mechanic talking to another mechanic and you use uh, uh, words about the technical terms in cars, um, then it's then it's jargon, but it's not doublespeak. Or if you're a doctor and you're using technical terms uh, for medical procedures with other doctors, it's jargon, but it's not doublespeak. So when does it become doublespeak? Well, when you use technical terms knowing full well, knowing full well that the person you're talking to is not going to understand you then that jargon becomes doublespeak because you're using the technical terms to intimidate, you're using the technical terms to impress, you're using the technical terms to manipulate the person instead of helping them understand, right? So uh, I think a good example of this is research studies that show that when women who go to mechanics Mechanics are actually something like twice as likely to start using long technical terms when women come in, and they're much more likely to charge them more for the same procedure. And so then that use of jargon has become doublespeak. That mechanic is using these long, complex terms in order to manipulate the woman into thinking way more is wrong with her car than it is, and so that they can charge her more. That is a manipulative use of doublespeak. So I really hope I've driven the point home here that what doublespeak is, 
is using language on purpose to manipulate someone. And using euphemisms, a softening of language, or using jargon, technical terms, in a manipulative fashion, then they can become double speak, right? So here's some example of, of jargon. Um, the act of smelling something you might call organoleptic analysis. And if you're a person who studies uh, like the sense of smell, olfaction, um, let's say that you're a neuropsychologist and you study that and you're talking to another person and you say, oh, um, I want you know, this rat to engage in organoleptic analysis, right? Because you, and that person's gonna understand you. But let's say you wanna just impress someone because you're like, oh, when I smell the roses, I engage in organoleptic analysis. And you know very well they're not gonna have any idea what you're talking about, and that is double speak. Or let's say you're trying to, uh, it like, let's say you're, you work in like glass manufacturing and, and um, you're ordering something and you uh, call up a, a, a wholesaler and say, oh, I need, you know, 20 pounds of fused silicate. And that person understands you because fused silicate is glass, it's a particular, right? It's a particular type of glass. Um, that's jargon, but not double speak. But let's say then when you're like a salesman and you're going, oh, look at this tabletop. It's, it's been fashioned with fused silicate, which is just a type of class. But you've said that in order to manipulate the person into paying more, that is doublespeak, right? Or, uh, uh, you know, if, you have, if you're a conservative and you want to talk about, you know, uh, conservative economic policies, right, you might say distributionally conservative notions, right? Which is, some, which is a phrase only, only a, 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 a con economists might use, right? And so you have these uses of language that are confusing to someone, but if you do that on purpose, then that is double speak, right? And so just keep in mind that, jar uh, especially for your future life, exam three, exam three, um, that you have to be able to recognize jargon and euphemisms, period, whether they're uh, a double speak or not, right? Um, uh, but if you're using jargon and euphemisms manipulatively, well, then that's double speak, right? And so keep in mind that the same phrase can sometimes be double speak and sometimes not. When two doctors talk to each other, right? Or if a doctor talks to you and uses the technical term, but then explains that to you, then that is not double speak. But let's say a doctor uses overly technical language with you in order to manipulate you into getting a procedure that's better for him for you to get, maybe better for you, but he just wants you to get it and go away, then that is double speak. I watch House, and House does this a lot. Um, in the television show, right? He uses uh, uh, jargon to manipulate his patients. Right, and then that is double speak. So moving on to slide 18. So we so we've talked about vagueness, we've talked about um, ambiguity, and we've talked about euphemisms and jargon, and how they can be used uh, manipulatively um, under this process called uh, double speak. I also want to just talk about a concept in, called spin, and what is spin. Uh, so spin is something that's done in politics. And, and it really, and there are these people who, are, who work for politicians called spin doctors. Um, if you watch a show called Scandal, uh, there is a lady on there who is a spin doctor, right? Her whole job is to manage scandals. Um, to, and what spin is, is trying to get um, people to see your version of reality, to only give them some of the truth, to use euphemisms, to use jargon, to selectively give them some of the truth, um, in order to leave them with um, your version of reality, right? That is the idea of spin. You're spinning the situation to get people to see it in a particular way, right? And it's basically propaganda. Spin is uh, a nicer, it's a euphemism, if you will. Spin is a euphemism for propaganda, where you're trying to get people to see the world in your particular way. It's creatively presenting facts to leave someone with a very specific impression, right? And, it, and it's disingenuous, it's deceptive, and it's manipulative. Um, and if you wanna see a great example of, um, of manipulation, um, I would suggest you go watch these, um, these videos. Uh, first from Wag the Dog, 
then you can watch uh, essentially several different examples of people spinning things um, in negative ways. And it's almost always in politics. You prefer to spin in politics. But what's more important than who to vote for, right? I mean, in this day and age, who to vote for matters. And so the fact that oftentimes politicians and news outlets spin the facts in a particular way to leave you with a false impression is problematic. And it's not unique to the left, and it's not unique to the right. Everybody's doing it. And so you have to try to get your information from as many different points of view as possible because everybody's spinning it. Um, the first clip I have here is from uh, actually a movie called Wag the Dog which is a fictitious account of politicians hiring Hollywood to leave people with completely false impressions of the world. But there have been examples of people doing this, of people making up the news, like real, politi real news reporters making, making crap up. And so although it's a sort of an extreme example um, from a movie, softer examples have occurred, right? And so be aware that just because something is on the news doesn't make it true. And just because somebody reports something doesn't mean they're reporting the entire truth. And they could be leaving you with a complete false impression. A completely false impression. So just, and, and I could come up with examples all day, right? Of, of people being discovered uh, just essentially Making, making stuff up, making stuff up, right? I have, I have three different examples here of people in the news who are supposed to be reporting the truth just making things up. Spin, it's terrible. So be aware, it happens. All right, which leads us to our last topic. Our last topic uh, with problems of language is called um, weasel words, right? Weasel words, and it's essentially it can be, it's, it's done in politics, it's done in everyday life, and it's certainly done in advertising. It's essentially where you replace a single word in a sentence, just one word. And because you drop in this one word, it allows you to later on, uh, if you say something, weasel out of what you said. Right? It's the putting in of a single word that allows you to say two things at once. So that later on, you could, like let's say I wanna, um, let's say I want to uh, like make everyone think my class is gonna be uh, just amazing, right? I might say my class might be the best class in all of the history of Pierce College. Now, I wanna leave with the impression that my class is the best, right? But I put in a weasel word, I put in the word might. So that later on, if someone says, hey, your class was totally not the best, and I said, well, I only said might, right? I leave you with one impression, but then if what I said later on doesn't pan out, I get to weasel out of it. And here are some examples of weasel words. Perhaps, maybe, could be, virtually, sort of, potentially, possibly, arguably. All of these are words you can drop into a sentence. Leave somebody with a one particular impression, and if it doesn't turn out to be the case, you can weasel out of your claim later, um, right? And so, uh, so what is a weasel word? Moving on to slide 22. It's a word that on its surface doesn't appear to change the meaning of a sentence, but in reality makes that sentence say nothing at all in terms of a claim. And that's when weasel words are important. It's when the person wants to make some claim about the world, wants to convince you about something about the word, the world, but they drop a word into the sentence so it looks like they're making some strong claim about the way the world is. In reality, they haven't really made any claim at all because they, because of this word, they can weasel out of it later. It's a way for a speaker to have it both ways. To say something, leave you with an impression, but then weasel out of it later, right? Th so that's what a weasel word is, right? Um, and so moving on to slide 23, can you guess what the most common, what the most common weasel word is in advertising? Can you guess? Think about it. Think about it. What's a word that could be dropped into a sentence that doesn't seem to change the claim at all 
for example, in advertising. But in reality, makes it so the advertisers can claim, I didn't say that. Have you got a guess? It's help. Yeah, it's help. It's the word help. And so check it out. This So check it out. Uh, this, uh, this acne cream helps prevent acne. It helps? Well, yeah, it helps. So how is this a weasel word? And why is it such a bad one? The word help sounds like this super positive word, right? It doesn't even sound like a weasel word. Probably, might, arguably, all of those sound like weasel, weasel words. And if you said, It'll, if I said to you, this will probably um, prevent acne, you'd be all probably. Probably sounds like a weasel word to me, but helps. It helps prevent acne. You want things to help you, right? But think about it. This cream helps prevent acne. And so then later on, if you use this cream, slather it all over your face, and you still get acne, you might go to the company and say, hey, I still got acne after you use it. And, we, and, they, and they said, hey, 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 we didn't say it would cure your acne, or we didn't say it would definitely prevent acne. We just said that it would help do that. And hey, you don't know how many zits you would have had if you hadn't been using it. You could have had twice as many. We didn't say it would actually work for sure. We just said it would help. See how powerful that is? Using a word that sounds like a positive, it's gonna help, actually allowed a, a company to say, leave with the impression that the cream was actually gonna prevent acne, but, cause listen to this, this cream will prevent acne is a strong statement. This cream will help prevent acne. You've taken all the punch out of it. You've taken all the meaning out of it. So later on, people still get zits, you can say, well, I only said it would help. I didn't say it would actually prevent them, totally, right? It's a weasel word, and it's the most common. And the most, the most manipulative, if you think about it. And so here are a bunch of examples of uh, weasel words in advertising. And these come from actual advertisements, by the way. Actual advertisements, it is, I, I got these. So here they are. Um, American Express will replace your lost checks just about any time, any place. Just about is the weasel word. Just about? Weasel word, weasel word. So when they say, hey, you didn't replace it where I was, they can say, well, I didn't say any time, any place. I said, just about any time or any place, right? That's very different, right? And it's, it's a weasel word. They wanna leave you with the impression that they'll do it anywhere, right? But just about makes it a total weasel. Number two, select quite possibly has the cleanest milk anywhere. Quite possibly, huh? As in there's a possibility that it doesn't. It's now 20% cheaper. Well, cheaper than what exactly? Weasel. There is more goodness. What in fact, what is more goodness? More people than ever are using, wait a minute, more people than ever? Exactly how many people is this, right? New and improved. Wait, wait, wait. New and improved, new, new and improved over what? Right? What was it like before? What is it like now? Weasels. Our blank will never be cheaper. Really? It will never be cheaper, huh? Wait. It, cheaper than what? Right? Like, is it already too expensive? Like, you're not saying anything. You're weaseling out. And of course, weasel words are all, all are used in politics too. Here's a bunch of examples from real politicians using weasel words. Right? Employment will begin to increase more quickly before long. Wait, before long? How long exactly? Is that a week? Is that a month? Is that a year? Is that 10 years? Before long? John Kerry, who is a Democrat. Uh, I may take, uh, it may take a new president to bring about the policy changes. Whoa, 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 wait. It may? It may? That sounds like a weasel word to me. Um, or how about uh, a Bill Clinton, another Democrat? When they asked Bill Clinton if he'd ever smoked marijuana, he actually said, well, I experimented with it. Wait, wait, experimented? That sounds like a weasel word to me. Experimented? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and, and not to leave the conservatives out, conservatives are just as likely to use, um, uh, Republicans, or rather, are just as likely to use weasel words. Senator Charles Robb, who's a Republican, he had an affair with, with Miss Virginia. He said, um, and he did, right? Um, but when they asked him about it, he said, no, 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 it was just a nude massage. 
Just a nude massage. What? All right. John McCain, another Republican. If current trends continue, we could potentially close the gap with Obama. This was uh, back in um, 08 when he was first, when Obama was first elected. We could potentially. Sounds like a weasel word to me, right? Um, and they're just everywhere. People dropping these words into language, right? Like horoscopes. You could, perhaps, you might, you probably. It's a possibility, right? Horoscopes are uh, driven by weasel words, right? Um, you, you'll never read a horoscope that says you're definitely going to get a raise today. It's not the way they work, right? Um, they always use these weasel words, right? And so as sort of an end cap to today's discussion, um, what you need to be able to do as a critical thinker is recognize when other people are using words and language and phrases in order to be manipulative, right? You need to recognize vagueness and how it doesn't communicate anything. Recognize ambiguity um, and that maybe someone is trying to leave you with one impression, but in reality, they mean something else because they've said something that can be interpreted in two ways or they don't want you to know how to interpret their phrase. Um, be able to recognize doublespeak, vagueness and ambigu uh, vagueness, and, uh, excuse me, euphemisms and jargon. And when euphemisms and jargon um, are used manipulatively, then they're doublespeak. Recognize weasel words. Recognize that so much of modern American politics is just uh, an exercise in spin. And our news organizations are often spinning things from their own perspective for their own selfish gains, right? Re be able to recognize when that's being done to you. And in addition, don't do it to other people, right? Um, a good critical thinker wants uh, the world to be a quest for truth, right? Um, and so don't be ambiguous, don't be vague. Don't use jargon and euphemisms uh, in the service of, of doublespeak. Don't manipulate others with language, right? Um, that's the idea, right? Last time we talked about how amazing language is as a superpower. Today we talk about how to use the ways in which that superpower can be used inappropriately. Um, so recognize when it's being done against you and don't do it to others. See you next time, critical thinkers.